Part 1 Alice Chapter 1 What does one wear to an execution? The very thought of asking this question out loud turns my stomach, a sour taste filling my mouth. How else could it be heard, other than as a flippant and callous concern in the face of such a serious situation? As I try to imagine actually asking someone this question, I shudder at the thought of what they might say, at the look that most certainly would show on their faces. It matters not one bit that I am genuinely unsure of what is appropriate to wear, that I want to avoid the very disregard that would be assumed in my question. The fact is that it would be heard as an expression of indifference that I most certainly do not feel. I am in no way indifferent to what I will witness today. Long-delayed justice will be exacted on the monster who murdered my only daughter, and I will be there, because she is not. It's all that is left for me to do for Madeline, though she deserves so much more. This is why choosing what to wear today is so important, why I wish I had someone to ask, someone who would understand, someone who would sympathize with my need to look mournful, but not defeated, vindicated, but not vengeful. Byron, of course, would have understood. In fact, I have little doubt that he would have chosen the perfectly appropriate outfit, laying it out for me on our bed without a word while I was in the shower, then slipping off to his study before I emerged. He had a way of doing that, a way of getting things done and meeting our needs without ever being noticed doing so. We'd turn around to find some small kindness done for us, yet no sign of Byron anywhere. Invariably, we would find him in his study, a newspaper folded neatly on his lap as he stared down at a crossword, brow furrowed and pencil poised. He loved that study, which was meant to serve as his home office, but became his sanctuary from the busyness of life. If I could help it, I wouldn't disturb him while he was there, unless absolutely necessary. Even the kids learned to respect that sacrosanct boundary without question. Except for Madeline, of course, who was always Byron's exception. His exceptional girl. Somehow, she could skip through the door, hop onto her daddy's lap, and insert herself as the center of his universe in a way her brothers would never have even tried. Byron would smile, lay his folded newspaper aside, and wrap his arms around his little Maddie. Even as a teenager, this ritual continued. Sometimes, not a word would be passed between them. Not even the inevitable turbulence of adolescence could disrupt this almost daily ritual. While he never favored any one of his children more than the others, there is a special bond between a father and his daughter. And so, the study became their shared place. After the murder, Byron began to retreat into the study with increasing frequency, closing himself in for hours at a time. Sure, as he left for work each day, he would kiss my cheek and pat the boys roughly on their backs, but even then he was not fully present. When his participation in family activities or at the boys' school events began to wane, I became concerned, urging him to stay connected. He tried, I'll grant him that, but no amount of coaxing seemed to work. I'm ashamed to admit that I even tried guilting him into engaging, reminding him that he still had three living children who needed him. This only served to drive him away further. And so, we learned to let him be, and appreciate those rare moments he emerged from his study to be with us.